Hey, welcome to another episode of the DDC Insider Podcast. I'm Brian Burson, your host, and today I have the pleasure of interviewing Michael Hafstetler. He's the founder of Basque Sun Care, a brand that empowers people to discover their purpose, get outside, and enjoy life. Hey, Mike, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, Brian. Excited to be here. Yeah, likewise. So why don't you start by telling the audience more about you, your background, and your company? Yeah, um, I think um, I'll get to Basque, but I think it's uh, good to kind of start at the beginning um, it, because Basque is this interesting intersection of, of my, my personal and professional experiences. Um, on the professional side, I have always worked in startups. Um, I've worn every hat that you can imagine within a startup, sales, BD, partnerships. I've run a growth marketing team. Um, most recently before this, I was the GM of, um, this place in New York that I think would be best described as, uh, kind of an incubator for startups, um, in all different sectors, but being there was really cool for me because that's what really opened my eyes to this whole concept of D2C. You know, it was New York. We had this mandate, get all the best startups in the city and being New York, a lot of them were D2C brands. Um, so, you know, we had the founders of Billy worked out of there, um, the founder of Huron, um, and, and Jenny Fleiss, the founder of Rent the Runway, was running Jet Black out of there at the time. And just talking to them and and seeing them and, and hearing about their businesses and watching them uh, grow was, was so powerful. Uh, and yeah, I was really turned on by this idea of, I don't think D2C as a business per se, but this idea of competing in categories that were previously assumed to be entrenched by building direct relationships with customers um, and selling to them directly. Um, so, you know, with that, I started to read all the different blogs and email newsletters out there. I was reading Lean Lux and 2 p.m. on a daily basis. I made a spreadsheet of all the different categories that, you know, I, maybe I could launch a, um, a brand in, um, didn't pull the trigger on any, but that was kind of like in the back of my mind, um, for, for context. And, um, the, the personal side of this is that I lost my uncle, uh, to skin cancer and he and I were very, very close. He was the coolest guy. He's a man about town in New York. He wrote a, a, a page six column for the New York Post and he lit up every single room. So when he passed away, that was a, a tough experience for me and my whole family, but also an eye-opening um, experience for me because I, I never really took my son's safety very ser seriously before that. And, um, you know, after that, I, I started to research everything that you know, I could find about skin cancer. We have similar skin tones, my uncle and I, and, um, you know, I, I have it in my family, obviously, so I'm, I'm particularly susceptible. So in my research, I saw two stats that, that really stood out to me. Number one is that skin cancer is more diagnosed than all other cancers combined, um, which is kind of wild considering how objectively preventable it is. The other stat, 54% of Americans never wear sunscreen under any circumstance. And so there's this huge disconnect because we have the most diagnosed cancer. We have a proven to be effective, widely available prophylactic in sunscreen and, and people aren't using it. And so I joke around that I accidentally started Basque and that's not you know too far from the truth um, because the first thing that I did to solve this problem was I started a nonprofit. It's... Um, called the Skin Protection Foundation, SPF for short. The whole idea was, let's go to beaches and public parks, give people sunscreen for free. We'll be the first organization in the world that's fighting skin cancer on the front lines. And it was only when I went to go find a sunscreen partner, um, you know, the, the product that we'll give out to people at the beaches, that I had this aha moment in the aisle of a CVS. I'm doing diligence and I'm like, holy shit, sunscreen sucks. This is an archetypal D2C play. 
You know, we've got stodgy brands, uh, commoditized products, questionable ingredients, terrible messaging. Uh, and so high level, you know, my wife who's my co-founder, she and I were like, you know, what if we built a better for you sunscreen wrapped in a beautiful brand um, that, that really appealed to young people um, and turn sunscreen from this like boring chore your mom made you do when you were a kid into something that was fun and fashionable and cool. Um, and then in doing so, can we get more people to wear it? And if we can do that, can we then fund this nonprofit effort um, with our sales? And so, you know, with that, the idea for Basque was born and uh, we ran with it. And I'll skip over a lot of details, but, you know, we launched it on National Sunscreen Day in May of 2021 and we haven't looked back. Wow. What a story. I mean, congrats. Congrats on doing everything you did. It's very noble that it started with a nonprofit, look, you know, trying to do some good for people that weren't even taking care of themselves, right? So that's uh, that's nice. So I got a question based on what you said. Why do you think that you could be different? You know, you mentioned that these ancient ancient um, brands with ancient products. How did you? pictured that initially, how do you say, hey, we, we can pull this off and stand out because of X, Y, and Z? You know, I think um, fundamentally, it came down to the fact that all the brands that I was seeing in the category were boring. Um, there was nothing that was creating any, time of, any type of emotional connection for me. There was nothing that I saw that made me feel happy or there was anything fun to it. And so in, in that observation, it became very clear, Hey, there's a, a real opportunity here. Um, in terms of how to be different. Um, you know, I think we did that on the product side and I can talk more about that, but I think the big thing, especially in consumer, especially in consumer that, is very much purchased in person. You really have to do that on the, the packaging and, and brand side. And what we did was we basically took all of the creative and all of the social media that we could find for every single existing brand. And we mapped all of the characteristics of all of those brands and we put them into buckets and we just said, okay, let's be the exact opposite. Um, I mean, that was the big thing. If you're in a category that you think is ripe for disruption or the folks aren't are the folks who are in there, the incumbents aren't doing anything interesting, just try to do the opposite, you know, instead of being, you know, overly beautified, instead of being really medicinal, instead of having like an upscale drugstore feel, instead of you know, putting MD at the end of our name, we decided we're going to be fun. Um, we're going to be tongue in cheek. We're not going to take ourselves too seriously. We're going to have super vibrant colors. We're going to have, you know, these really cool, um, you know, retro photography. Um, and, you know, we're going to take this like sunscreen, but make it fashion approach, which nobody had been doing in the space. And that would be you know, how we would stand out and, and, and get people's attention at first. Yeah. And I think of the fact that many people nowadays say that building a brand is not something that is worth it up until you do 10 millions in revenue or something like that. What would you say to those people? Um, you know, I, I would say that it's hard um, at the beginning, for sure, at least. Um, but I think if you're doing something that you're passionate about, um, I think it's really rewarding at any level. Um, and I'll say, you know, for us and for me personally, like this is the hardest I've ever worked. This is the least money I've ever been paid from, you know, a salary perspective. Um, and it's the most fulfilling work I've ever done. You know, I, I, I leap out of bed despite, you know, the stress involved with, with starting and, and running a business 
and, and a brand. And it all comes back to that why. Um, and and the, the thing that gets me excited is the reason that we're doing this. We have a mission. Let's, as naively ambitious as it might sound, like we want to end skin cancer. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get there, you know, ideally to those, you know, revenue milestones that are, you know, incredibly compelling. But in the meantime, like we donate 10% of our proceeds to, uh, not to nonprofits that are, are helping fight skin cancer. And some of the direct donations that we've done, uh, have been just amazing. We've, we've donated literally hundreds of thousands of units of sunscreen to, um, organizations that support low income kids that couldn't get their own sunscreen. Um, you know, we work with the fresh air fund out of New York. They take, uh, kids from, you know, uh, low income families in, in New York city, and they bring them out to camps and after school programs. And our only ask of them is, Hey, give them their own sunscreen that's theirs and teach them about sun safety. And that's phenomenally rewarding, especially considering that 30% of cumulative UV damage happens before the age of 18. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think the big thing, and I think this is a big differentiator too, if we go back to, you know, how to, how to stand out, having a reason for being is really important. It's important for a founder, for your, you know, uh, mental sanity. Um, it's, it's important, I think, for the consumers too. I think people are done with just more junk in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's a great uh, TED Talk by Simon Sinek that he talks about th this is the core of Nike and the core of Apple. People don't buy what you do or how you do it. They buy why you do it. Um, and for us, we have a very, very clear why that people have really responded to. Um, so, you know, having that why is, at least for me as a bleeding heart millennial, is is fundamentally important. Yeah, I agree with everything you said. Two things to highlight for the audience. One, having a mission, I mean, the importance of having a mission for you as a founder will, based on what you're saying and what I believe as well, will change the whole thing. It will have, the, the whole thing will have a different meaning for you. And communicating that to your customers will have a different meaning for them as well. And that's also the way you stand out because you will become otherwise just another, you know, product on the shelf for people to choose from. And if they know why, if they know about your mission, if they want to support you, if they share the same values and you become something else for them, you become something, something different. And that's the way you can stand out in a, in a, in a crowded market in the red ocean right now. I mean, with some exceptions, like only few exceptions, every single product already exists, right? Uh, again, there's a few exceptions, but well, chances are you, that, that if you're starting a brand, you're already selling something that some somebody else is offering. It could be better, worse, but it exists. So brand is how we stand out. And brand involves, of course, the mission, the values, et cetera. So I think that's that's great. You mentioned the numbers as well. You said, you talked about, you know, money, salaries, revenue. So I wanted to ask you about that. I, I discussed in one of the latest episodes with Neil Goyal at TapCart, the importance of profitability for brands of any, of all sizes, actually, right now. So what do you think about that? Do you think that, is it feasible for you to be profitable in the first order? Do you aim for um, being that, or how do you, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I think profitability is, um, really important at, at least, for, at least, um, net margin profitability and, and gross margin profitability. Um, the, I think at least for the time being gone are the days where, uh, consumer brands are getting funded, like, um, software companies. And, you know, it, it's kind of the only way to build right now. Um, uh, unless you have absolutely 
ridiculous traction. But even if you do, uh, if the fundamentals of the business and the fundamentals of your your acquisition aren't lining up, then you're not going to be around very long. And so for us, you know, this is a long term play, um, and we don't, you know, we don't want to just be some quick win. Like we really have some important work to do, and we want to build something that's long term sustainable. And in order to do that, um, you know, being first order profitable is super important for us. Um, you know, we don't have a, a, a strong subscription play, at least right now. We're a, a pretty seasonal category. Um, people tend to, to buy more in the summer than they do in other months. And um, you know, so it's especially important for us. Um, and every founder that I talk to is shifting here if they're not already here and you know the reason being that there's not as much capital um in the category right now so you can't just you know fundraise and fundraise and fundraise and then figure out how to get profitable later you either need to be there or you need to have a very very clear path um to that that you can communicate um and so for us we just try to be first order profitable um and i think you know if you're not going to be that, then the alternative is to have a very, very clear understanding of what your LTV is, and also a very clear understanding of how quickly you can get to your break-even point. Um, and I would say that those are the two things that you really have to understand is either how to be first order profitable or how to get to break even quickly if you're playing a, a CAC to LTV game. Yes, I agree. And based on conversations that I have had with multiple founders and clients as well, I think it could be both of them and not one or the other. And I will explain why. First, I think it's very important for brands that can be profitable in the first order to be so, because why not, right? And even if they can, for most of them, it's not how they make real money. Like on the first order, they are profitable. That's great. But the bulk of the of the money comes from the repeat orders they get. Again, depending on the industry, et cetera. So it's great to be profitable in the first order if you can. But even if you are, it's really important to try to, let's say, decrease the time between the future orders, try to encourage customers to order more times a year. I think in your case, and correct me if I'm wrong, should be probably educating customers on the importance of using uh, you know, screen care or, um, yeah, sun, um, sun care the, um, during the whole year and not only in summer because of the, you know, the the global situation and the global warm, et cetera. So what do you think of that? Are you, are you guys active on not only being profitable in the first order, but also to encourage repeat orders as well? Yeah, and, and, and that's the real key and something that we're really focused on figuring out. And I would say the first thing um, that we were really focused on figuring out was how to get to first order profitable. Um, and it wasn't always the case for us. It wasn't like day one, we had this CAC that was amazing. And, you know, we had this great AOV. We were losing money on first order for a while, but we were constantly hacking away and testing and testing to get our average order value up and to get our acquisition cost down. And we've got this great graph that shows the two and then, you know, it just separates. And that's where it's like, okay, now we've got some momentum that we can we can play with. Um, but And then one of the very important um, keys to driving up that AOV and getting our blended customer acquisition costs down was, our owned and operated channels. And we put a ton of focus on email. We put a ton of focus on SMS. We put a ton of focus um, on our organic social. And um, that allowed us to convert a lot of folks who were sitting on our list who hadn't converted yet. Um, but it has also allowed us to drive our second and third purchases. And so now we're in this phase two of getting a good sense of how quickly 
someone moves from first purchase to second purchase, second purchase to third purchase. And what we're trying to do now is to um, minimize those gaps, you know, have a quicker first to second and a quicker second to third. Because what we've seen is that a two order purchase customer is um, phenomenal magnitudes better than a one order. But if we get somebody to purchase three times, um, they are absolutely phenomenal and very, very sticky for us as a business. So figuring out how to move them from one to two and two to three is our, our, our real big focus right now and to condense the time frame between those orders. And, and we've got some new products coming um, pretty soon that we think will help us um, uh, lower that time to two and three. Awesome. One thing to highlight for the audience about something you said is that it was a combined effort effort in order to increase the um, the profitability in the first order. It wasn't just decreasing the the cost the cost per acquisition, but it was also increasing the the AOB. That's very important because some people choose only one side of the equation or one bottle, you know, which is, oh, let's try to aim to a lower CPA or something like that. But it's also combined it with the actually the highest lever or the highest opportunity, which is to increase value because you can decrease the, the cost per purchase, but only so much, right? Because you, you control the channels, but how much can you decrease the cost per purchase actually? But on the flip side, you can increase the AOV. I mean, the sky is the limit. You can be creative with the, you said you tested offers. I don't know if you tested bundles, but whatever, you know, to the AOV to be higher than it was, I think that helped way more, right? Yeah, no, and I, I, it definitely, and it was the first, it was the one that was actually far more to your point within our control. Um, so we saw movement on AOV before we saw movement on our customer acquisition costs. And then once the two were going at the same time, it was great. And so things that we did, um, we started doing a bunch of bundling. Um, bundling was, was a big unlock. Um, another thing that we did was we raised our free shipping threshold. Duh, right? But like we didn't think about it for a while, but we raised our free shipping threshold Simultaneously, we raised the price of shipping underneath the threshold um, by like three dollars. Um, we moved it from four ninety nine to seven ninety nine, and then we did um, a fifty dollar uh, free shipping, and up from forty. Which, especially considering the cost of an individual unit of Basque, did a lot for us on the AOV side. Um, and then we started to run a, a lot of uh, gift with purchase campaigns. And so once a month, we had a gift with purchase campaign running. And typically to get the gift with purchase, you only had to reach $40, um, which was still $10 beneath the threshold. Um, and that really helped us juice the AOV as well. Um, but yeah, AOV was definitely the lever that we hit first, um, that that made the initial impact that helped us to sustainably, at least in the performance channel, acquire customers. Yeah, I can imagine that for many brands, doing that could be you know frightening because they are they might be afraid of losing customers if they increase the threshold for I don't know, the shipping threshold or if they increase some other you know um, some other um, things for people to buy. So. I know that people sometimes are scared to to change, but um, these sort of things are proof all the, over and over to be, uh, you know, uh, positive in the in the short term, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I think you know we've got a, a a couple of formulas that we use internally. Um, we think about revenue as simply an output of a bunch of other inputs, um, and one of our core formulas is. Customers times frequency times AOV. And if you think about, oh, I want to double my revenue, you can double any one of those inputs or you could increase them by 33% each. Um, and you can really start to take bite-sized chunks out of how to grow your business. Um, and AOV is just the, it's the unlock that's most in your control. 
um, and has, you know, uh, unless conversion rate plummets because of something that you're you're doing, um, you know, AOV is the tool that's most in your control um, towards getting those revenue outputs that you'd like. Yeah, very true. And I like that math. You have internally or that formula. Talking about acquisition now, I know last year you did something in the eyes of many brands or marketers, unusual, let's say. So what did you do for Black Friday last year and why? Yeah. Um, so we've been, we've just kind of been in this like limbo state of how to approach Black Friday and, and Cyber Monday because we have, interestingly, we have an asymmetric high season versus everybody else because our high season is the summer and everybody else is just Q4. And one of the great things about, you know, how we position our acquisition is that we pay less um, than, than most people in our high season. So that's great. Um, and so when we look at Black Friday and Cyber Monday, we're like, okay, it's unbelievably competitive, not like with other brands in our category, but every single brand on the internet. Um, it's super expensive. Um, and, you know, is it worth it? I guess is kind of the question that we keep asking ourselves. And we've done a bunch of different things um, throughout the years. And, you know, we've paid, you know, and, and run meta ads promoting our deals and run them across all these different affiliate sites and things like that. This year, we decided we're not going to do any of that. We're going to turn ads off. You know, we've got a big enough email list at this point. You know, why reward all of these um, new people who don't have any affinity have never supported us in the past with some really, really deep discount. What if we just say to our customers, hey, thanks for being here with us. Um, and uh, we're going to give you a deep discount for Black Friday, Cyber Monday. Um, so that's what we did. And you know, I wrote a post about this on on LinkedIn that, that got a, you know, I don't know, a decent amount of attention, got a lot of comments, um, uh, people sharing their perspective of, on it. And, um, you know, I'm not sure if we'll do it again or not, but the, the results were interesting. I and mean, we had phenomenal sales days. Um, we converted a lot of customers from that ever important two to one to two and two to three that we talked about before. We got a lot of folks off of our list who were dormant and who hadn't purchased before, who did purchase. Um, and we literally spent zero dollars on advertising um, and had a really nice month um, as a result of this campaign in what should be one of our slowest months of the year. Um, so there are some definitely some pros and cons to it. Um, and I think the thing that we continue, uh, and I'd, I, I would love your thoughts on this, like, you know, just discounting in general, you know, it, it, I think it's something in, in e-commerce that has become uh, just something that you assume you have to do and should do. You should run a discount to get people onto your email list. You should run Black Friday, Cyber Monday because everybody else is doing it. Um, and I wonder if that is the play, I think, especially if you're building for uh, something uh, long term. Uh, so we've got a lot to figure out there still, but that was our approach to Black Friday, Cyber Monday this year. I love that you did what many brands always, you know, try to do and never do. It's like, oh, I'm tired of Meta, I'm tired of Google, I will turn off the ads, we'll do it and see what happens. <laughs> and it did it, and it worked great. This is my point of view. I'm not right or wrong. This is just the way I see it, right? I think that you... I mean, based on the results, you definitely don't need to pay for getting orders from your existing customers. That's clear, right? You got great results, great feedback. I don't know if you would have gotten more orders from those people with paid ads or not. We will never know. But if you got great response, great, uh, you know, a great number of orders from them, it's clear that for them, that, that works. You don't need to pay an extra if you don't want to. Now, 
I am a believer that we can have in today's era of digital marketing and marketing in general, segmented messages, offers, and many other things for different people, right? Different groups of people. So do you need to, to offer the same discount to people who are new? No. If you don't want to, no. Can you offer a lower discount? Yes. If you want to, of course, but is, is it possible to avoid, let's say, rewarding them in a different way than those who have been loyal to you for years? Yes. So if in a low season, you can pay for acquiring customers when they are in a mood for buying whatever comes to mind, in this case, something they need, you can make them aware of the problem they have, which is using this product in a, in a, in a season, in a time of the year that is not you know, a no-brainer for many people. Like it's a no-brainer when you go to the beach, when you go to a pool, when you go outside in, in the summer, but not in winter or in autumn, right? So it's probably that the message should be like a problem aware type of message. Like they are problem, sorry, problem unaware. Like they are not even aware of the problem they have, many of them, right? So I think that if you ask me, I would probably pay for those people and offer them something lower and see if the same works for the for the for the email. I would also, I don't know if you did this last year, but I would probably do something to encourage people to be on the list and receive something better, right? Or to be a part of your community, whatever that is, if it's a Facebook group, if it's an app or whatever, but to be a part of your community so they can receive something else. So you can segment segment that even more, like non-customers who are not in your list, non-customers who are in your list with a different discount as well between them and customers, which of course they are, are, in, they are in your list. So that's the point of view. And then last thing I will say, and I will let you talk, I promise, about discounts. No, this is interesting. I recently read something about cashback instead of discounts. There's an app for this, for this. I don't remember the, the exact name, but I will add it to the show notes, which encourages people to do either one of the two options to claim the, 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 the cash back on their credit card instead of the discount mm -hmm. after they buy or to receive that money in store credit. The thing is based on these people is that many people don't claim either. Like they don't claim the money in either ways. And some people claim it in store credit. So you get the money, let's say back because you own the money, they have the credit to spend, but it's a repeat purchase, but upfront, right? I'm not saying, and they are not saying either that you shouldn't do any discounts at all, but can you reduce, can you reduce uh, discounts? Yes. Yeah, I think that there, you know, I think ultimately there's some sort of hybrid out there, you know, um, and um, I think that's what we'll probably end up doing next year. You know, some element of what you said of, you know, kind of your very, very top of funnel folks, runs and paid, run a discount, but it's a different discount than the people who are on your list who you really should reward since they're your customers. Um, and you don't want to train people to wait for discounts, obviously, but you know, something nice and, and maybe it's very specific to the, to the holiday season. Maybe it's, you work on some you know, new gift with purchase and, you know, it's a discount plus a gift with purchase and yeah. that becomes your kind of your black Friday. And then, so you've got um, a hybrid solution that addresses various parts of the funnels of the funnel simultaneously, um, and, and and that's how you roll it out. But then you also have, you know, the folks like um, you know Ryan from Jolie, uh, uh, the showerhead company. I follow yeah. him on LinkedIn. He's a great follow, and they're doing so well. And um, you know, he says no discounts ever. You know, we're not giving away for our for our email list and. You know, there's something compelling about that as well. So yeah. it's 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 some it's something you gotta figure out as a brand. Um, you know, Chanel is definitely not getting 
giving out discounts and and they've been around for a long, long time, been very successful. Um, so, but I think what we'll end up doing next year to kind of wrap a bow on this is, is to do some sort of hybrid um, that addresses various parts of the funnel in different ways. Yeah. I think when it's, when you have, when there's something deep in your values, mission or whatever, which is, I don't know, no discounts policy. I don't know. It, it can even become a part of your marketing and attract people rather than repel them. But when you are, you know, you don't necessarily be that uh, or at that position with discounts, you can be at that position with something else, right? Like use sunscreen always, all year long, every day. And here's why, like, no, no sunscreen. Like you, you use sunscreen, right? So there can be different positions for different things. And I see, I think something you said is interesting for the audience to notice just in case they didn't, which is the, the benefits on Black Friday. Of course, people expect discounts, but that's not the only thing that they that you can offer to them. You can offer gifts, you can offer giveaways. You can do many more to add value to your community um, that has been loyal forever, right? So you can you can offer them different um, things they value to avoid being to avoid perceiving that you're offering the same thing to a stranger than to them, right? So I think, but I think there's a place and channel for everything. So I think that segmenting the communication, it's it's awesome. The same happens with your customers. You know, some people I interviewed or clients I work with, they they do different strategies and messaging for the levels of customers they have. They have like, let's say, customer categories internally or something like that. So they, some of them write handwritten notes, different ones for each order to with them, some of them call it VAP customers, some of them call all customers or many customers randomly. So some people have product testers. So they have they before releasing a product to the public, they they have this group of people. They the group has a name, it has an identity, it has like, and they love the brand and they accept their feedback in order to innovate before mass producing the products. So do you have any of that, by the way? Like um, I don't know, do you do you incorporate customer feedback on at on some point and in any way? Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to hit on I love handwritten notes. We do a lot of handwritten notes at Basque and we've got, you know, our our fun stationery that we made. I think in the early, early stages of a brand, doing things that don't scale. Um is really important, um, you know, especially if it's related to making your customer feel special. And it's not just about making them feel special, like they are special. They're your early advocates. You know, where would you be without the, you know, first hundred purchasers that you ever had or the first thousand purchasers that you ever had? So treat them well, put on the white glove, get them that white glove treatment. So, so important. So we do a lot of handwritten notes. I think that's a great Idea. And, and and also like CX, like I, I encourage founders to be actively involved in customer service and go above and beyond. You know, if FedEx or UPS or the shipper loses a package, that's an opportunity to show your customer how much you care about them. You know, it's not necessarily a bad thing to go and say, Hey, you know what? I'm going to send you two of them. I'm going to expedite the shipping. And I threw in a hat, you know, because I want you to know that I care about you getting this. I care about you being a customer. I appreciate it. Um, and, and, and I'm going to go above and beyond. And that, you know, long term, it creates a ton of stickiness with the brand and that experience. And the bigger you get, the harder it is to do that. So that's something that you can do at the early stages that sets you apart and sets you up for a lot of future success. Um, and then to answer your, your your more direct question about customer feedback, it's everything for us. Um, I'll give you kind of two examples of that. First is when we were launching the business, my wife and I, neither one of us came from personal care or beauty or sunscreen. And so we didn't know the first thing about building those products. And, but, we do have, you know, and I, I specifically have a, a performance marketing um, background. So I applied that. The first thing that we did was we surveyed 50,000 people 
uh, between my wife and I, we personally interviewed 500. We wanted to find out what people hate about sunscreen. And it took a long time and it was so worth it because we got so much incredible feedback. We got all of these amazing adjectives and we built all these word bubbles. Um, and But we were able to solve for the issues that people had. And so there were some smaller ones that people didn't like that sunscreen stings their eyes, solve for it. People didn't like that sunscreen stains their clothes, solve for it. Number one, far and away, not even close though, was people hate how sunscreen feels on their skin. And we got, this is where we got all these amazing adjectives. It's, it's oily, it's sticky, it's greasy, it's goopy, it's got a white cast. And so we maniacally focused on solving for that. You know, like, hey, if we want to end skin cancer, we need to get more people to wear sunscreen. If we want more people to wear sunscreen, we better solve for that thing that's preventing them from wearing it and reapplying it. And we did 63 product iterations again. 63. Yeah, again, 63. And again, we were getting customer feedback the whole way through the process. We were doing, you know, I guess you call them focus groups. We had these, you know, groups of people at each formulation, we'd go and we'd test it. And we didn't stop until 95% of them told us, love how it feels on my skin, not like, or not, you know, think it's okay, but love how it feels. And then we wanted 90% of people to pick us in a blind field test versus the other leading brands that are out there. You know, so if, like, hey, if we're setting out to do this thing, um, we better beat the the benchmark that's in the in the category already. So that's why 63, because we didn't stop until we hit those benchmarks. But now we have this data that demonstrates, hey, it really is the best feeling sunscreen. We really did solve for that number one pain point. We really are living out the mission. Um, number two is we're, we're, we're constantly talking to our customers. Um, we're constantly reaching out just to say, hey, how was it? Did you enjoy it? You know, I try to call. Um, or email five people a week. And then other folks on the team are also doing the same thing. And we've got kind of like an interview template that we do to get a sense of who they are, you know, um, what type of media do they consume? How old are they? Um, we know where you live, but like, do you have vacation houses? That's like an important thing for, you know, sunscreen. Um, we just try to build um, uh, a more comprehensive understanding of who our customers are. And further, um, we've got a really robust tagging system within our um, CX platform. And uh, by virtue of these conversations and cataloging all of the outreach that we get, um, whether it's in a social media comment or in an email to us, we under we have a really good understanding of what our customers want. And so we were going to launch a face product after our initial SPF 30 lotion and spray. And the feedback was overwhelming that what customers wanted was an SPF 50. So we scrapped face for the time being and we released an SPF 50 product for them and our SPF 50 is now our best-selling product. And it's exactly what our customers said that they wanted. Um, and so it's like, it helps to listen to your customers. A, they're going to tell you what they want to buy. Um, and so you can sell it to them. And B, if you learn more about them and who they are, you can go find more of them. Um, and so we think it's creating this feed loop, feedback loop between us and our customers that goes beyond just hey, submit a product review that shows up on our site is really, really important. Well, this is going to be the episode probably 140 or something like that that we do in the podcast. I have had many founders say great things about the product development and testing process, and I love all of them. But actually, and truly, you went above and beyond by doing the blind test with your customers. And I love that because one thing is to say, I iterated X versions of the product or during X years until I found the ideal product, but nobody stopped and said the ideal product, not for us, but for our customers. And 
they actually said that like explicitly they chose it you know in a in a in a blind test so i have never heard of that on the podcast at least from a ddc brand so again i was clapping when you were saying that because i i truly wanted to congrats you because it's it's inspiring to see that you care to the point that you want to say i want to offer the best so you let me know and i will stop and i won't stop until i do it and it's easy to say, you know, it's easy to watch Rocky, like the movie, and watch him succeed uh, and and walk through the stairs or run through the stairs and, until the top, but it's not easy to do the process in real life. You said 63 iterations. Most people, including myself, probably I would give up after uh, the fifth or the third even, and he did 63. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, well, I, I appreciate that. And yeah, I think a lot of it was born out of um, the fact that, you know, we hadn't done a, a product like this before. You know, we just didn't know. And in sunscreen, especially, you've got very high minimum order quantities. So if we're going to go to market with something, we have to make a lot of it and we have to spend a lot of money on it. And so, uh, you know, we also really want people to enjoy this product. So let's just do the things that we have to do to ensure that we're making a sound investment on the right product and that people are actually going to like it. Um, and, you know, almost like because we didn't have any experience, we took a few extra steps to ensure that we could sell this stuff, right? Um, and, and getting that direct user feedback, again, to like the kind of, uh, first point so so important first party data you know that's awesome that's great uh, mike this has been great i know we are in time so i want to be respectful with your time uh i wanted to thank you for coming to the show and before you go i wanted to ask you one thing i like asking every guest that comes on the show which is if you have a favorite book that you would love to share with the audience a book that you love that helped you in any way yeah. Um, okay. I've got a book and I've got a podcast, uh, or sorry, a Ted talk, not a podcast. Uh, the Ted talk is the one I referenced earlier, the Simon Sinek start with why there's a book version of it too, but you just need to see the Ted talk. And I just think it's great. And then, um, the book is, uh, scaling up and it's by Vern Harnish. And, um, it was really helpful for me. Uh, this is my first startup and, you know, he gets into a lot of um, the nuance of running the business. And I think it's especially important. It's important for every business, but I think it's especially important in consumer products, cash conversion and cash flow and your cash conversion cycle. And reading this book was really, really helpful for me to, to, get, a, to get that under control in this business and turn it into an advantage for us instead of a, a scramble. That's a great one. And another one related to being profitable first is Profits First. I don't know if you read that one. I haven't, but I will. Yeah, it, it was recommended by some founders here already. And it's a great it's a great book. Uh, it's all about, of course, being, profit for, being uh, profitable first. And uh, it's not only about math, but it's about the way you think, the mindset of being profitable first and how you start by saying, hey, this is what I want to make, you know, the net margins, et cetera. And then, okay, here are the expenses, here are the things that I need to have so I get this result. But it, it all starts with the profits. So it's a great read for anyone looking for that. And scaling up is great as well. So thank you again for being on the show. I wanted to ask you before we go, where can people find you and your company? Yeah. Uh... Great question. BaskSunCare.com. Um, you can follow us on on Instagram, Bask underscore SunCare. Um, I don't know when this episode is airing, but starting March 1st, you can find Bask at Nordstrom nationwide and uh, about a thousand other brick and mortar retailers uh, throughout the country that are, are boutiques and net hotels. That's awesome. As a coincidence, you will go out on that date. So so as for today, you can go and find the products there. 
So for everyone who is not on the website, please go to the ddcinsider.com. You will find the episode and there you will find all the show notes, including everything Mike mentioned, the books, resources, and everything else. Mike, again, I wanted to thank you. It was a lot of fun and you delivered a lot of value. So I wanted to thank you again for being here on the show. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I really enjoyed it.